Welcome to Study Buddy, meditation philosophy for the heart of your practice. This is a live online discussion of ancient yogic texts amongst meditation practitioners in the Shambhavananda yoga tradition. My name is Acharya Satyam, a resident teacher at Konalani Yoga Ashram in Hawaii, and I welcome you with love and respect. Namaste. Okay, so we've got um, two focal points for today. One, life is but a dream. That was our previous drishti, our focal point. And the second one is we're going to explore time. Just looking around to see if anybody's eyebrows lifted on that one. No, just Bob's. Okay, cool. Yes, we're going to explore space and time on our next sutra. So it should be a lot of fun. So let's recap here uh, and figure out where we left off. Open the door for some conversation, a little bit of journaling. Nana Devi, all right, made it. So let's start with pronouncing this um, sutra. Tada, Rudha, Pramite, Stakshaya, Jiva, Samkshaya. Tada, Rudha, Pramite, Stakshaya, Jiva, Samshaya. So this sutra talks about desire vanishes in the fortunate person whose consciousness has become established in their true nature for them the state of limitation has ended and one way that we explore this that was given to us by the sutra sort of a really helpful focal point was this idea that um we sort of go through something like this every day when we wake up, or if you have a dream and you wake up from it, you're dreaming, you wake up, it's gone. That whole world is gone. And it makes you realize, okay, so there's this perspective I can have of my life that is not so bound up in the objective, quote unquote, objective reality that I see before me. Every day I wake up from a dream and I prove to myself that that's that this reality can't be understood from just the outside. And so as a thought experiment, we said, well, watch, watch in your own reality. Imagine for just a moment that you're in a dream right now. You're not going to try to fly. And you're not going to try to wake up. You're just going to observe. You're just going to play the part of I am in this rare moment when I'm realizing I'm in a dream. It's very rare, right? To have that realization. And you're going to try to hold on to that because we know how easy it is to slip into this thought or that thought. The dream morphs constantly. And so you just keep holding on to, I'm in a dream. I'm not pushing it away. I'm not pulling it in. I'm just holding on to this awareness. And then you feel with that, where does that take you? Suddenly, your surroundings, you have a little bit of separation. There's a sense of witnessing your space. You might even see the peripheral vision around the edges instead of being sucked into the objects in front. And when you sustain that kind of awareness, it's a very unique experience. And what's interesting, what the sutra sort of points us towards, is that you actually feel a connection. You feel a connection to everything around you. Not in the usual sense, outwardly, but you feel like, yes, I can see how everything around me right now is relative to my being, relative to my viewpoint. I can see that my reality might be my own making, just like it is every night in our dreams. So let's take the next two minutes to sustain that inward focus, but allow ourselves to participate in the external world through a little bit of writing. It's a really good exercise to try to have both, right? Shambhavi Mudra, inward focus and outward awareness, which in this case is writing. So um, literally just take a couple minutes to feel and reflect on this experience for you or on the experience you've been working with over the last week.
All right. And taking a moment to finish the thought you're on. Scan through what you wrote. Appreciate what you just did. No need to rush on to the next thing. Underline a keyword or phrase. And we'll just drop those in the chat box. Um, and, in, you know, we don't have to wait for all the words to come in to start sharing. If anyone feels like they're going to want to share, please, by all means, go ahead and unmute. Go ahead, Bob. And, yeah, I look forward to seeing everybody else's words when you have time. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> since I just woke up from a nap, <clears throat> mm. yes, that happens when you get older. Um, <laughs> I went from sleep to awake. And then you sit here and say, go from your awareness of your body to awareness of something much deeper. And then I felt that was very much like going from sleep to awake. And as a result, I went from kind of a dull stupor to laughter in in the very moment of your of your telling me reflection. Or, or, of me going from oh here i am sitting in front of my camp <laughs> computer to then oh yeah i do feel that joy inside my heart it was and it was just like that was so much fun i was like i just had to start chuckling wow I think. nice thanks bob yeah absolutely i mean it's like this metaphysical stuff is not supposed to land us in our heads, right? It's supposed to land us in a direct experience of something that's happening within us. So thank you for reminding us of that, sharing that experience. That is the sign of a yogi is joy, uh, joy-filled wonder. That's what the sutras say. So that's good. Yeah. I see some keywords, process, surrender. You want to read one? Ground up, ground up. <laughs> or is it from the ground up uh, and mindscape? Anyone else want to jump in and, and elaborate or share? I'll share. Okay, yeah. Um, one sec, I can zoom out. There you go. Can you Hi. hear her okay? Can you hear me? I've got the bad mic today. <laughs> okay. okay great. Um, I had kind of a similar experience to Bob of um, that, like zooming out was really sweet. And it as I was journaling, it was illuminating because it started of being like detached, which um, I know is is like a good thing in yoga but sometimes feels, I don't know, like there's other connotations to being detached. That's like not necessarily joyful. Like maybe it's like just numb or separate. And so it was really fun for me to experience how detachment was really spacious. Mm -hmm. And um, like Bob shared, like that detachment helped me feel like something so much bigger so it wasn't isolating it was like mm. through detachment i felt like even more connected very nice i i have i have the same experience you know it mm -hmm. when you can you like sort of see the room around you you actually feel the whole space that you're in instead of feeling like you're this little thing you actually feel and you feel a connection to in a way that you it's different than the way we normally connect by like grasping. Mm. It's more like an inside out kind of connection. And you just feel like you're a part of something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess detachment is what helps the raindrop merge with the ocean. It's sort of that feeling. Very nice thank you that actually helps because that that's a common 
analogy and, and image or anyone who maybe hasn't heard that one before there's a raindrop falling from the sky it's screaming i am a raindrop i am a raindrop uh which is the equivalent of, of you of all of us saying like i like this i don't like this my name is this i want to do this with my life i don't want to do this and you know it's all these things that define us and then when they hit the ocean this raindrop proclaims i am the ocean from a very different place it's like that and, uh, and that that's that experience is something that the yogis describe as the experience of going from a state of awareness that is identified as your individual self to a state of awareness that is identified as something much larger and i think you know you can have that experience just by zooming out a little bit just with this awareness like okay i'm in a dream right now this is a dream and suddenly you feel there's a larger experience happening that you're a part of, like a raindrop in an ocean, a larger current, a larger scope. Sure, Dandy, and then Yogita. Uh, yeah, Yogita, you'll go right after this. Let me just uh, mute and go ahead. Okay. Hello? Hello? Okay. Yeah, um, something the bias said kind of resonated with me because I was kind of feeling like I noticed this pattern that I have to kind of feel like other like I'm always feeling on the outside I'm always feeling like I'm weird more weird than everyone else or something and but then this kind of makes it feel like okay but someone's dreaming all of us like we're all just um, someone's experience in the dream state or some consciousness some ocean of that we're all connected to this and it, it just makes me feel connectedness this sutra <laughs> thanks dandy yeah and especially you know i think that's the dynamism we're seeking is that someone that's having this dream of all of us is you too but it's not the you that you might associate with as dandy but rather but is available through your personal experience if we are willing to surrender the small self it just keeps on expanding you know so you're right it is someone it is available to you that someone we wouldn't necessarily be able to name but yeah it's available Yogita, you wanted to chime in? Thank you, Dandy. I'm definitely the ocean tonight. Wow. <laughs> I, I, um, I got my 21 tar poster and I have been framing it and, and working with it and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard to describe how I feel. I don't feel like me. I, I feel like I'm in a dream or something. I, I don't know. It's just, I feel floating or mm. I'm just, I just, it just brought a lot of energy into my apartment and I've been redoing my, um, me my meditation corner and you can't see it. Uh, it's, it's all out here. And I don't know. I just got, I'm too blissed out to be here tonight. <laughs> wow. so. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, you know, mm. That's so great that you can, you know, even just be available to receive all that bliss and to, to recognize it. And um, and I'm really grateful for this analogy of the ocean because the the dream thing, although incredibly effective for me, you know, the the idea of the raindrop becoming the ocean, that's like a passed down story. So that like really helped me sort of bridge that feeling I was having to something that I've always wanted to understand more. So I'm glad you're feeling like the ocean and that Yogita. <laughs> and that you came and shared it with us, even though you could have just sat in your apartment and just blissed out. <laughs> Appreciate it. Got just a minute or two more if anyone wants to chime in with another comment or question. Sure. 
Sure, Anju. I'm having more of a raindrop week. All right. <laughs> That's all right. But um, it's been interesting to work with this because it kind of gives you this like space to work from. So I have these things that like make me feel like I'm very like here and a person in this body and like, and then I remember that I'm in this dream, right? Like coming back to like a mantra or, you know, thinking back to class and like trying to work with what you've been doing. And then it all feels so silly, <laughs> but it's a lot of work. And so I'm like ground up from that, like kind of yo-yoing between those spaces. So I'm not maybe either a range up or the ocean yet. I'm just some sort mm -hmm. of like vapor that's <laughs> finding my way. <laughs> nice. Nice. I'm just sort of feeling with that space between, you know, that space where like you can, and I think that's a really honest um, reflection of, of, of the experience of meditating. You know, and I think that's the part of the conversation that in our school, we talk about a lot because we really do meditate and it commonly gets overlooked in like magazine level discussions of meditation you know it's that space of being in between those two states to basically just keep redirecting yourself in a certain direction and and not always having the um comforts of of this like uh achievement or landmark you know um i remember yogita maybe a month ago Oh, I think it was in your presentation, Yogita, when you were like saying how you had achieved something and you knew that the very next day you'd have to achieve it again. Like that even when you do arrive at those spaces, you have to re-arrive and re-arrive day after day. So I think that's a really, you know, honest place to be. And to be perfectly honest, seems like a very productive place. That's sort of where the, the work happens, as you named it, the vapor, the vapor space is, <laughs> is really the transformation. So. Yeah, I was just sitting here thinking I, how I could hang on to this. And, and <laughs> you know, I mean, this this morning I felt terrible. And it, it just, I don't know. How mm -hmm. do you hang on to it? You just. <laughs> uh, I mean, from what I can tell from Babaji's, you know, answers to that very common question, you know, I think it's in the moment of that thought, surrendering that very thought is to me the first step to hanging on to it because it's that's that thought, how do I hang on to it is the is the beginning of 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 when it starts to contract, you know. So it's yeah. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, yeah, Tashi, hey. I heard you're back there. Yeah, yeah. So I just switched cameras. And cool. So I uh, think this is really been enjoying this sutra uh, and some of the implications of imagining you're at a dream. Um, I find that it just opens up so many more possibilities, right? Like you could fly or you could do whatever <laughs> you want, but what what I think, you know, I I want to strengthen is uh, my practice and sort of like the ability to surrender and um, you know visualization within practices that I'm doing, and I find that if I imagine that I'm in a dream, visualization is just like there. It's just like there it is, you know, innumerable sentient beings, boom, there they are in a dream. Uh, so the value I I feel for this, uh, for me, it has been that it's really empowered my uh, visualization and idea that I can just like dive in and do something mm -hmm. as opposed to like, oh, I'm, you know, in reality, it's just like, okay, I'm just in this room and that's kind of imaginary. Mm -hmm. um, but in a dream, it's like, here it is, it's, it's here. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tashi. And just sort of absorbing, especially that last sort of moment. Yeah, may we all be able to hang on to that last aspiring comment. You know, here it is. It's here. It feels like 
there are these qualities of of being in a dream when you can almost feel like how subtle like babaji says it's like a soap bubble how that that awareness is so subtle and so i wouldn't call it fragile but it's just it requires so much surrender to hold like the soap bottle bubble has to land on you you know and you just can prepare to receive it as the sutras say you know and and it feels like that's this uh detachment that this thought experiment sort of puts in our lap for a moment is here it is you know it's like okay here it is like if you want to go in that direction then you got you know like you got to recognize what direction that is it's definitely not a grasping one And we are gonna transition. Um, was is maybe something you could type in, or, or um, we're gonna transition to our next segment. And as always, if there's any comments that didn't get out there, type them out, send them to <laughs> me. You know, it'd be awesome. I'm, you know, Bob's been pretty steady. He sends me a, a, his uh, pocket sutra every week, and. When a few of them compile, then we can like put that into the newsletter. So help Bob get into the newsletter, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we need a couple, two or three to compile together. So um, let's take a moment for tension release. Um, if you know it, go for it. Um, I will just lead a little bit because there might be some people who are just getting used to it. Fingers are outstretched below or to the sides of you, just above the floor can swallow and then just slow the breath down and try to relax as you visualize as Tashi was saying from this different place inside from the ungrasping place so let the visualization be um, relaxed but visualize that crystal clear prana flowing in through the third eye down the throat to the heart holding the breath in the heart without tension for about the same amount of time you breathe in. And then visualizing a smoky or ashy substance pouring out of the heart, down the arms and out the fingertips and palms. You can imagine like you're doing this tension release practice in that subtle space, that dream space, and you'll feel that power that you have that's ungrasping. After that last exhale, just let everything empty out, flicking off fingertips, wiping off arms. And we'll prepare for our next sutra. Oh, you know what? The next sutra is the same sutra <laughs> doing the last half of the same one. So it's the same Sanskrit. Tara Ruda Pramite Stakshaya Jiva Samkshaya. Um, so this is the second half of the sutra. I forgot to mention that. Um, and it's pretty interesting and cool because it sort of just goes after something here in the second half that uh, wasn't really even mentioned in the first half. Um, Gita, or if you're nearby, you know, enough to read, could you unmute and read this first section for us? It is said that it is said in that Kalika Krama, 
that yogi who is always established in their own nature and who is determined to destroy the sphere of time, Kala, by fixing their consciousness on the timeless point, will in the near future find that time has ceased to exist. They are established in the final beatification of God consciousness and have achieved the state of final liberation. Thanks, Gita. And then the next point is just very similar. So Prophetji, could you just read this next one for us and then we'll reflect a little. Swami Lakshmanju comments, when your consciousness is resolute in finding the timeless point, then you are said to be okay. Kalagra Saikatat Para, determined to destroy the sphere of time. Where is this timeless point to be found? It is found between two breaths, between one step and another step, between one word and another word. Thanks, Prabhupada. All right, so reviewing here. So the yogi who is established inwardly destroys the sphere of time by fixing their consciousness on a timeless, on the timeless point. And I thought this was interesting in the near future. <laughs> so interesting to add that in. We'll, we'll come to realize or come to see that time has ceased to exist. And again, to wrap that comment up, that this timeless point is found between breaths, between steps, metaphorically speaking, you know, between our movements and even between our thoughts, between our words, etc. Yeah, we have a question comment here, Abaya. Okay, question comment. Um, I had an experience today that I wanted to share because it had to do with time. Um, this morning I was doing pujas and Dandy is learning the puja. So she was sitting next to me and we were doing it together. Um, and we did this on Tuesday as well. And on Tuesday I was cooking breakfast. So I was like, okay, I don't have a whole lot of time to do this puja. I didn't say this out loud, but inside of myself, I felt that, you know, I was like, oh, I can't explain everything as much as I would like to, because I had that little like tick, 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 like you have to finish the puja in time to make breakfast for everyone. And we still had a very nice puja, but I could feel almost that, um, that binding of time, you know, that like, like that, that tightness or just the, I can't say it better than like the tick tick that just keeps going um and then today um Satyam was making breakfast so I was like I got all the time in the world and um I felt so relaxed inside and I explained everything in like how I wanted to because I felt so spacious and we finished the puja quicker <laughs> like not on purpose but it was just this like a mind bending experience of how my my mind totally changed based on whether I felt like I had enough time or not. I'll leave it at that. Mm. Um, did it feel more spacious to you, Dandy? She was in the same time warp as me, so <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Dandy said it was longer, but it was shorter. How does that work? Raise your hand if you feel that what she was talking about have you had that experience yourself curious yeah yeah very literally had that experience remember when i was learning the yagya at shoshone it's another puja based <laughs> time thing i remember being in a lot in a hurry because i was always really slow at it and i would like miss breakfast and and you're just you know it's cold and, all, and i just remember asking uh a mentor at the time at shoshone like what should i do about it i just feel like blah blah and she said just try not not even looking at the clock at all or just try not not worrying about it and just see where it lands you just focus on your puja just focus and sure enough um it landed me right on the minute for you know when it was supposed to end and i never looked once in a two hour 
time span, you know, and I see some heads nodding. So it just, yeah, that's, it's real. Um, we think we understand time. We need to use it. It's practical, but you know, there are these occurrence occurrences that just show us that, um, there's, there's other contributing factors to the experience of time. Maybe that's just the simplest way to put it, that it's not, it's not necessarily what our external world looks like, um, that there's internal factors that affect our experience, which is sort of in line with, you know, the sutra, the idea that once you have a mastery of this internal world, some, your external world changes quite dramatically. And in this particular moment in the sutra, if I go back to the text, um, you know, when they say time ceases to exist, we're really referring to limitation ceases to exist because in Hinduism, time, kala, and death Yama are the same deity. Um, and so the idea is that when you are caught up in the horizontal aspects of time, you are under its control. And when you are established within, um, you are in control of time, essentially. Um, that you actually sort of live outside of its, of its, gravitational hold um, when you are established you know within and so trying to get beyond time is really just us trying to get beyond our own limits itself the raindrop we're just right back to that that limitation that looks like the raindrop yeah i have a fun science aside in this one that I think is pretty fun, but simultaneously a little distracting, but I think, I think we could be, I think it's okay to distract ourselves a little bit. Um, so when you're looking, when you're thinking about relativity, if you've ever studied relativity, even in like a kid's book version, what you notice is that there's like a, what what the you know the prevailing feature is to visualize space as this tapestry and heavy objects uh create a gravitational force so it's like a so let's say a comet's trying to go by but it like it gets sort of sucked into that that little down you know that little swoop and it starts to orbit and when it so instead of being able to go straight it has to go around and it bends that experience of time for that object um and so the sun has this incredible gravitational force. The earth is rotating around it. We can't, you know, we're not going to get free of it. Uh, a neutron star has even more gravitational force. It bends so much, you know, that it pulls in more around it. And then a black hole has, I guess, the most we've observed. Um, so much so that light can't even get around it. Like light goes past it and gets you sucked in and it can't escape the pull of that black hole. And so this bends time. And so there's this concept of like large masses can bend time. Now, how much time do they bend and how, what's, how much time are we talking about? So I have a couple of fun facts. If you meditated at the edge of a black hole for one year, how much earth time would pass? So if time is different at the edge of a black hole, than it is on earth and you sat there and you meditated for one year okay one year how much earth time would pass when you come back to earth in the chat box i'm i'm open to just to go ahead type in some some guesses in the chat box just for fun we don't always get these trivia moments it's probably the only one of the year or in a black hole year Okay, we have no idea from Prophecy. Good try. I don't think that's going to be it. Bob, zero idea. Okay. Pizza, nothing. Infinity, it's thrown out there. It's probably going to be a little less than that. 
Okay. Hundred years. Good, good guess, Shoshone. Good guess. At least we have a number now. You're our first and only guess. You win by default. All right. Five thousand years. Excellent guess from El Dorado. Interesting. Go in the opposite direction, Yogita. Okay. Interesting. Yep. It's gonna get shorter. I don't interesting. All right. So oh yeah, go ahead. <laughs> all right would we go back in time again yeah we're gonna go we're gonna keep with the standard math on this one that we are it is making time longer okay so the answer <clears throat> to put it simply is that if you had started this meditation when the first neanderthal appeared on the earth 250,000 years ago, you would be now arriving back at earth. So one black hole year is 255,000 years in our time. So it just gives you this scope of like this, this concept of like mass, it can unfathomably change this experience that we think is fixed. Right now, so yeah, so all of humanity would have sort of existed in the span of one year of you meditating by a black hole. So Hinduism is not afraid of big numbers. Hinduism throws out big numbers all the time. Whenever you're reading, like when I read the Ramayana, it must have been 50 references to like the span of the universe and they're not even afraid to be like oh yeah and it's going to end one day and then it's going to be a start again they just this stuff is hinduism just it's in the vocabulary you know yeah bob you can go for it i was thinking earlier of uh, baba took me to uh, nepal at one point and they showed us a statue of vishnu and he's lying down mm -hmm. and he's dreaming the universe and they said, and at some point, Vishnu wakes up and the universe disappears. Mm. And it's something like 500 billion years or something like that, some incredibly large number. Yeah. But I, I was just thinking about when you were talking about you wake up from a dream and that whole dream disappears. Well, that's just like what Vishnu does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I mean. Hinduism is just not afraid of throwing out big numbers and also letting things just completely evaporate and... And really just like they're not afraid of this, these bigger cycles, you know, because we're really not limited by those cycles if we do our practice, you know, like we, there is any, you can escape this gravitational pull of time, you know, you can escape samsara, you know, simply by going inside to destroy this sphere. It's even described as a sphere of time, which, you know, that, you know, that black hole and the sun and the neutron star, these are all, you know, that's the same concept, this sphere that bends time. So let's just talk about real quick before you meditate, Hinduism describing something similar to this, where they, um, in Hinduism, the lifespan of Brahma is considered 100 Brahma years, which is known as a Maha Kalpa or a Pararda. How much time would pass if you medita meditated next to Brahma for one year? year so when we talk about a black hole we're like wow it's a that's the biggest object in our plane we don't that's it that's all that's the biggest we got and wow one year two hundred fifty thousand years that's unfathomable oh my god and then it's like okay well hinduism's talking about their you know the deity of of creation associated with creating brahma 100 Brahma years. Okay. So um, if you meditate next to Brahma for one year, how much earth time would pass? Oh, cool. We have a guess from Shoshone. 100 trillion years. Thanks, Shoshone. Um, attention to those zeros. Great job. It gets confusing after nine. So I believe that is 100 trillion, correct? No, is it a billion? Thousand, million. Oh, it's a billion. 100 billion years. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, really. Well, it's it 
just FYI, the difference between a billion and a trillion is like the difference between, you know, the drops of water in a, in a five gallon bucket and the drops of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. So billion to trillion is like a huge leap. Um, so, um, any other guesses? Hundred billions, not going to cut it. Okay, here we go. You meditate next to Brahma for one year. You come back to Earth. There, there's no Earth, by the way, when you come back. 311.08 trillion Earth years. Um, 23 times the entire lifespan of our universe. Okay, so that... The idea here is that the numbers are unfathomable, but that Hinduism in our practice, we're talking about like the big experience. We're talking about we're talking about going beyond the horizontal. And I think they're not afraid to go big on the horizontal because that's not where we end. You know, we're not afraid of of these concepts uh, because that's not where we exist. Um, so I want to end with a quote from Babaji that is going to, uh, oh, it's a little bit longer than I was anticipating. I'm sorry, because I, I think you're cutting into a meditation, but I just want to read this very beginning part. The better we become at the spiritual side of our lives, the more the world flows for us, less anxiety, pressure, and doership. And he says, I have found over the years that being in the present is a very positive way to live. And he says later, Live in the present and you can begin to move beyond your worries and fears. So what destroys, what, it, what is the one thing bigger than a Brahma year? What's the one thing bigger than a black hole year? You know, the present. The present is the biggest sphere there is, you know, and it bends time infinitely. Nothing can escape it, you know. So if we can't identify with the present, we can actually go beyond this limited experience. So all those numbers were fun. I said they'd be a little distracting. That was sort of our one distraction that we get in this class for the year. So I hope you enjoyed it. But the idea was that the present is the biggest sphere of them all. Nothing will bend time more. Thanks, Prophecy. She says she's been feeling this lately, that the present makes time, about the, the present making time flow, about the relationship of the present and time flowing. So let's sit. Let's meditate. Let's work with it. It's all fun. And then when you meditate, you actually get to do it. So take time to establish a seat that's sustainable for you. Twenty three times the span of our universe. One year. Okay. All right, so we are in the present right now, but are we, and that's where our, where our work is. You know, your breath is happening in the present. Your body sitting still is one way that you can physically tap into the present. So let's start there. Swallow gently lengthen and sort of try to float the spine, the head over the shoulders, shoulders over the hips. And then let yourself try to relax into stillness. Stillness being the present. There are many ways, of course, to physically tap into the present. This is just one way. But letting yourself relax into stillness as if you could sit like this for a long, long, long time. Just 
So when you have to move, that's okay. Move a little and then settle in for a long time. Don't be afraid of time. Because if you can actually sit in such a way that you can be still for a long time, you go beyond time. You will feel buoyant. You will feel light. You won't feel limited. So sit like you would be sitting for a long time. Again, a lot of the itchiness we get when we sit, a lot of the little movements we get, it's because we don't think we can make it a long time sitting. We sort of psych ourselves out. No need for that. Make it your goal to be able to sit in such a way that it feels almost eternal. And feel the joy in that. There's so much we can benefit from by really just being in our seat and starting to feel within our physical body and be physically present. Because when you actually relax the body, while maintaining awareness. The body is blissful. Allow yourself to encounter the breath in this timeless way. As the Guru Gita says, long and windy pranayamas can actually be distressing. It's better to just attain the natural state. Nothing against pranayama at all, of course, but just to say that the natural breath is one of the rarest pranayamas of them all. To be able to watch your breath and to let your breath move as if you could breathe like this for an entire day without needing more breath, without over-breathing, When you feel any tightness in the breath, work with it. How can you breathe in a way that is truly sustainable?
as we move within the koshas, it's like we're moving to different densities of our being. You can work with the body in a few minutes, but when you work with the breath, you feel like you need a few more minutes. And so it takes more time to work with this subtler layer. So be more patient than you were with your body in finding this sustainable experience. As you continue to work with the body and the breath, you may have already begun, but repeating a mantra with your breath and bringing your awareness to the heart. And you encounter the mind. And so if the body is like the sun, the breath is like the neutron star, then the mind usually has the weight you know, of, of that black hole, it has that density. It's hard for things to escape it. But we can. Working with the mind is even more subtle than the breath. You have to be even lighter with your touch and yet more aware simultaneously. So bringing your mantra to your breath flow is the beginning. Repeating that mantra from the heart represents the trajectory of your work. And at the center of the heart, at the center of the black hole, at the center of your awareness in science is the singularity, the single point. Just let yourself work for these last five minutes with your body, breath, and mantra towards this singularity in the heart, single pointed awareness.
and let yourself experience this singularity in the moments between your breath, this space beyond time. You can allow the eyes to gently open if they're closed. Invite some subtle movement to your spine. Namaste, everyone. Thank you so much for your time, which is priceless and also beyond the sphere. Um, Hope you enjoy working with this, you know, space between your breaths, space between your steps, space between your thoughts uh, in the weeks to come and look forward to checking in with you about that. Um, if anyone feels inspired about the previous sutra, please send me some notes and uh, have a great weekend.